Great. So as I mentioned today, we're going to be taking a field trip with NASA's Chandra X Observatory, but I would really like to start out by taking a poll um, with everybody. So if we could launch poll number one, the question that I'm starting out with today is, would you ever want to go into space? If you were ever given the opportunity, would you like to say, fly up to the International Space Station or perhaps fly to the moon? And please go ahead and respond to the poll as you are putting in your responses, whether for yourself or your students. I will just say that for me, though I did want to be an astronaut when I was younger, I realized pretty quickly that I can barely go on like the tilt-a-whirl at an amusement park. So for me, blasting off into outer space probably would not be the best for my sensitive stomach. However, I dearly love planet Earth. I am very happy to be here with my feet firmly planted on the ground. And it looks like we have a 100% response that everybody else would like to go into space. That sounds awesome. I am definitely excited. We have so many adventurers here with us today. So we are going to share the results of the poll and then go ahead and quit that out. Okay, so let's see. Uh, 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 great. Okay, so my own path into STEM, I actually started out working in molecular biology. I was not one of those people who just knew right away when they're young, I wanna go work in astrophysics, went to be an astrophysicist, done. Quite the contrary for me, I wanted to be a hundred different things when I was younger, a doctor, an environmentalist, a zoologist, a veterinarian, you name it. I wanted to save the world. And for me, that path just seemed clear that I'd like to go into science somehow. But even then, I really wasn't sure what I would do. So I started out in biology as an undergraduate at university here at uh, the University of Rhode Island, um, which is not too far from where I am today. And then I realized really, um, as I was staring through a microscope for you know hours and hours of some of my class times that I did not actually want to study things under a microscope for the rest of my life. So for me, it turned into computer science. I wandered down to my computer science office and they sort of adopted me and I really had just so much interest in learning how we could use computers as tools to be able to squeeze all of the lemon juice out of the data that we have in science. And so that combination of skills and biology and computer science brought me to visualizing the universe for one of NASA's missions. And it was absolutely the case for me that coding just helped me unlock the universe, so to speak, of data and sort of figure out how I could help tell stories with that scientific information. So feel free again to ask a question at any time in the chat. And I'd like to talk a little bit more about the telescope that I get to work for, NASA's Chandra X Observatory, which was launched back in July of 1999. So Chandra is a mature mission at this point that has been doing so many tremendous things in discovering new exciting things about our universe. So to introduce that, I just have a short message to you all from Colonel Eileen Collins. She is the woman that commanded the NASA space shuttle mission, STS-93, that launched Chandra back in 1999. And here's what she has to say. I'm Eileen Collins, commander of space shuttle mission, STS-93. I was also the first woman to command an American space mission. On July 23rd, 1999, my crew deployed the Chandra X-ray Observatory. We had trained specifically for this flight for over 16 months. My crew felt personally responsible for the successful launch and deployment of Chandra. We trained heavily in simulators. We did standalone simulators with our training team, and we also did joint integrated simulations. Leading up to the launch, my crew was very confident that we were totally trained and ready to go. We weren't nervous, we were just primarily focused on doing the best job that we could. That summer, we had two launch delays. The first one on July 20th was due to a problem on the space shuttle. And then the second launch delay was two days later. And that was due to thunderstorms in the launch area. But we were happy to finally get the launch off on the third attempt, about the third time that the crew had uh, strapped in to the shuttle. People often ask me, what does it feel like 
to be in a space shuttle launch. It sounds like you're in a room that's on fire as you've got the boosters and the engines burning around you in what we call a controlled explosion. There's so much shaking in first stage when you're on the solid rocket boosters that if you try to write, you would not be able to read afterwards what you wrote. We had a successful launch and we were able to proceed with procedures to get Chandra on its way on flight day one. So looking back, it was a perfect deployment. Our crew watched the Chandra float away. We took our final photos and our final videos. As we watched Chandra float away, it seemed like it was almost like a sailboat on a calm sea. We knew that no one would ever see the Chandra again, but that we would still feel its presence as it continued to send its data and its information to Earth for many years to come. I really just enjoy Eileen's message. Um, it was just an incredible crew that quite literally put their lives on the line in order for us to have incredible views of our universe. And now we're going to hear um, a little bit more about the launch from our former director, Dr. Belinda Wilkes, who was there when it launched back in July of 1999. Here we go. Less than one minute away now from the 95th spatial launch. 35 seconds. T minus 30 seconds. When Chandra went up on the shuttle, so the shuttle basically lit up the sky like daylight for a couple of minutes as it went up, and the ground underneath our feet shook. Five, four, three. We have a go for engine start. Zero. We have booster ignition and liftoff of Columbia, reaching new heights for women in X-ray astronomy. We were two or three miles away. So it's just an amazing feeling of, of the power that is needed to escape the Earth's gravitational pull, which we needed to do to get in orbit. And also amazing to think that mankind can actually do this. It's very um, satisfying and exciting to see the results of all the years and all the people who've worked on Chandra and finally it goes up. Some really cool words from Dr. Belinda Wilkes as well. And so the Chandra X-ray Observatory is an observatory that observes X-rays from our universe, which means we have to launch Chandra up into outer space thanks to the space shuttle and the crew of astronauts and all of the scientists and engineers that built Chandra and prepared it for launch. So Chandra is about the size of a school bus and really gets to look at fascinating things in our universe, things like exploding stars, things like the areas around black holes and even things like clusters of galaxies or galaxies that are merging and interacting with each other, things like baby stars and ever so much more. So why we need an X-ray telescope is that there are many different kinds of light in our universe to be able to detect and learn from. And we are used to the type of light that our eyes can detect here on Earth, which is visible light or optical light, but that's just a very tiny portion of the total available kinds of light that are out there. And you're probably familiar with some of them. So let's go ahead and launch our second poll. If we could put that up, I'd love to know what kinds of light have you used or have you interacted with in your own life? Have you interacted with infrared light, ultraviolet light, x-rays, or most likely visible light? Go ahead and put your answers in the poll. And I will wait for a second. And it looks like we've got a bunch of different answers coming in pretty spread evenly across the board, visible light being the most popular for sure, but also x-rays, ultraviolet, infrared light, and wonderful. All right, we're gonna end our poll and share the results. Fantastic. So as you can see, there's lots of familiarity with many different kinds of light. And that's fantastic because many of us do use all different kinds of light in our daily life, even if we're not necessarily familiar with that. So for example, if you've ever used a microwave to heat up something for lunch, perhaps you're using microwave light to disturb the water molecules in your food to be able to heat it up really quickly. If you've ever gone to the doctor for perhaps a broken bone or a cavity, that means they're using x-ray 
pathways on you to be able to penetrate down through the skin and the tissue into the bone or the tooth to be able to see if there's a cavity or a crack. If you've ever used a remote control to turn on a television, you're using infrared light to be able to talk between devices. And if you've ever read the comic book on the Hulk, you know that the Hulk was apparently created through, what was it? Gamma rays, right? So there are all these different kinds of lights that we can interact with in our life. And it's important to be able to study them and to be able to study our universe through them. Because if we only had access to one kind of light, visible light, what we can see with our eyes, it'd be like only being able to see down the third baseline on a baseball field. You would have no idea what's happening at first. If there's a pitcher on the mound, if there's a catcher, what's going on, who's in the outfield, you wouldn't know where the ball is necessarily. But when you get to use all of the different kinds of light that we can use to detect things in our universe, the radio light all the way up to the gamma rays, for example, then you get that entire playing field. You get to see what all of the players on the baseball field or the softball field are doing. And you get to see where the ball is, where the action's happening, who's scoring, etc. So we need many different kinds of light to be able to figure out what exactly is going on. So being able to study an X-ray light from Chandra is very, very helpful. And I thought I would take you on a very short tour of some of my favorite sites to see in the universe. Most of the images that I'm going to show you in the next minute or so are a combination of X-rays from Chandra with either optical light from the Hubble Space Telescope. Probably a bunch of you have heard of the Hubble Space Telescope before, or perhaps other kinds of light, such as radio lights or ultraviolet lights or infrared light, et cetera. So we're going to start kind of small. Um, here we're going to start with a stellar nursery where the tallest pillar of gas and dust where baby stars are being born is about four light years tall. And a light year is the distance that light travels in a year, which is about 10 trillion kilometers. So that first little pillar is about four times 10 trillion kilometers or 40 trillion kilometers, which cosmically speaking is pretty small. So this beautiful sort of stellar nursery is where all lots of baby stars are forming and then starting to mature. Clusters of young stars, because young stars like to hang out kind of like teenagers, they can hang out together before they go off to say college or onto their way to work. And we've got lots of other kinds of stars as well, mature stars, like this globular cluster where we're seeing some of the oldest stars in the Milky Way. Mature stars that are much more massive than our sun getting ready to explode in perhaps say 50 years or perhaps not for another 500 years. But if this star does explode, we are totally safe, by the way. Um, other kinds of stars like planetary nebulas, where it's sort of like a glimpse of what our own sun might do in, say, 4 billion years. That's billion with a B, so a long, long time. But as stars like the sun that are kind of middle-aged and middle-sized, as they start to run out of fuel, they sort of puff off their outer layers and create these beautiful things that are called planetary nebulas. But really have nothing to do with planets. It's just an old historic name. So planetary nebulas are gorgeous and also exploding stars. Supernova remnants are some of my favorite objects in the entire universe. Chandra is particularly good at imaging them and studying them. And we also have things like supermassive black holes that Chandra has studied. In this case, this is the supermassive black hole at the very central region of our own Milky Way galaxy. And galaxies, of course, are fantastic objects as well. And Chander gets to study galaxies of all shapes and sizes, galaxies that are paired off and interacting or merging in the shape of exclamation marks, cartwheels, whirlpools, and more. Massive jets that are streaming out from supermassive black holes, clusters of galaxies where there are tens or hundreds, if not thousands of galaxies, all enveloped in a cluster of hot gas and even clusters of galaxies that look like they're smiling back at us here on Earth thanks to something called gravitational lensing. So those are just a few of my favorite places to visit with Chandra. But essentially, Chandra, since it launched, has traveled billions of kilometers in its orbit around Earth. It goes about a third of the way to the moon. Um, it's taken 3,000 trips in those orbits. It's taken over 25 trillion bytes of data. And it's taken more than 4 million lines of code to operate Chandra, to collect all of that data, and then to analyze all of that information.
So how do we do these things and how special is Chandra? Well, with us now is Sabina Hurley in this short video. She's gonna tell us a little bit about just how difficult and interesting it was to be able to build Chandra in the first place. They knew the science that they wanted to do, the technology to do it didn't actually exist. Countless engineers had to solve a whole host of problems to get Chandra on orbit. The mirrors on Chandra, those mirrors had to be smooth to the level of a couple of atoms. You're skipping photons, so they need to be atomically smooth. And they have to be really delicately aligned because you need all eight mirrors to be working together, right? And they are now focusing on an instrument, and the instrument chips are only four inches square. And you have to hit that four inch square every single time. And that's not actually good enough. That would just give you a blob. So to get the imaging you want, the resolution you want, you have to hit exactly the same spot on that four inch square every time. And the spot you have to hit is less than the diameter of a human hair, 10 meters away. Then you have to do this on Earth, but it's gonna operate in zero G. So you need to figure out how can I align these so that they'll be aligned on Earth for testing but then when it's up in space, it has to stay aligned. You can't go up and fix it. So how do I build all the structure around it so that they stay aligned so precisely through all of that? So once you've done that, you have to make sure that you're controlling the temperature of those mirrors to within fractions of a degree. But you're in space. It's a harsh environment. The engineering and the level of testing and trying and retrying and testing to get just the mirrors right is absolutely mind-blowing. All right. And just to talk a little bit about how we capture data with Chandra, making use of those gorgeous mirrors, what we do essentially is we have a selection of objects that, that are going to be studied in a specific day. And the folks on the ground, the engineers and the controllers have uploaded all of the code to the telescope during the day so that it has its commands and it knows what it needs to do to get its job done. Chandra is slowly pointed at whatever object in the universe we're going to be collecting light from. Those photons, those packets of energy have been traveling to us for some time, if not thousands of years, perhaps millions or even billions of years. And Chandra collects that information as it goes down through its mirrors to the base of the telescope where the scientific instruments are. The information is recorded and then it's packaged into like a suitcase of binary code. And that suitcase, that digital suitcase is then sent down on its way through NASA's deep space network about every eight hours through one of the dishes um, in the DSN, the Deep Space Network, either in Madrid, in Australia, or in California. And then eventually it makes its way to NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory before finally making its way to our control center and the Chandra X-ray Center where scientists get to unpack it. So that data all comes to us thanks to all of the commands and the code that the engineers and operators at the Operations Control Center for Chandra get to do. So here is a brief tour of the control center. Um, and you know what, I think I forgot to share my browser window. Kristen, could you confirm that you can see the control center tour for me? I can see just the, the first part. You're in the control center. Okay, great. So I did share it. For some reason, I thought I forgot to share that window. So, all right, we are in Chandra's Operation Control Center. We have just gone off the elevator from our building in Burlington, Massachusetts. I, I know we have some folks elsewhere in Massachusetts, so it's not terribly far from you. Um, this is a restricted location, and during the pandemic, it became even more restricted. Lots of safety protocols were put into place, but this is the view when you first get off the elevator and then turn to the right. There are some images on the wall and some old um, like blueprints for the observatory used as wallpaper. Up in the back is one of our main conference rooms. And then as soon as we turn around, we can actually can. see. Yeah. Yeah. You're still just in that control room. You're not moving. Hmm. All right. Let's see if I can stop share for a second and go back in and share PowerPoint and Safari. There we are. 
All right, let's try that again and see if it likes it now. All right, are you seeing the control center zoom in now? Yes, yes. Wonderful. Okay, so as I mentioned, we're going to go to the back of this first area, the lobby, so to speak, where we come in. And there's a little uh, exhibit area off to the left where we can see the banner that flew on the STS-93 mission with the astronauts. They took some videos and pictures in front of that banner way back in 1999. And then over here in the corner is a replica of the Chandra spacecraft at about one-tenth the size. So as I mentioned, Chandra is about the size of a school bus. So this is a very small option, but it's pretty detailed and uh, correct in its anatomy, so to speak. So now we're going to go back down towards the elevators and then cruise into this first hallway where there is like a little exhibit of sorts that talks about the history and the making of the Chander Observatory. Chander was essentially born as a concept in the very early 1970s, late 1960s, and took quite a few years to sort of massage that concept and then get funding and then get all the technology into shape in order to create the observatory. But by 1999, it launched and we have had a control center for Chander ever since. This is actually the second control center. The original control center was in a building in Cambridge, um, but we had to move it because they were replacing us in the rents in the building. Um, and we built the second control center here. And you can see that there are a series of rows of consoles where all of the flight engineers and the lead engineers and the flight operators get to sit every day. During the pandemic, we were on reduced staff to keep everybody safe and keep everything healthy, but nothing ever stopped for Chandra in any of the time since the pandemic has been going on. Chandra has always been able to be managed safely and beautifully here from the control center. This first seat right here is where the lead spacecraft engineers console is. That person is essentially responsible for the health and safety of the spacecraft itself. Over on the left-hand side is the um, command controllers console. They're there to make sure that all commands that are going to and from the Chandra spacecraft are done well and everything is proceeding beautifully to keep things happy and smooth in Chandra's operations. Then up here in the front, we have this really interesting wall of monitors that you probably could see from the back. You're seeing at any given time the commands or the uplink or downlink to NASA's deep space network. That's what the series of radars right here on the middle area would happen to be. That communication happens about every eight hours. And then on the left, you're gonna see where Chandra is in its position. There's going to be other information that talks about Chandra's exact location, its altitude, whether its temperatures are all manageable, everything is happening beautifully. If there are any issues or other problems popping up, um, that'll all be placed on the screen. In these other rows right here and right in front of us, row three is where all the science instrument team members sit. So the folks that are actually making sure that the science instruments that are doing that recording that are capturing all of that sciencey goodness are in good working order. And up here in the middle row are where some of the other subspace sub spacecraft system engineers sit as well. Um, all of the different functionalities and issues that are required in order for a telescope to be able to work, those engineers take care of them. And then way back here in the corner, we have an artist who likes to be able to draw little uh, schematics and comics throughout the days. And right now is there one that says, keep Chandra up Chandra Ops. So that's kind of a bit of fun artwork. And here is another view of what our control center looks like. So there are a number of rooms off to the side of the main control rooms for other meetings, for other um, scheduling of um, events. And then we're going to go back out here where you can see the exhibit continues and you can get a glimpse of a couple of those other meeting spaces um, where lots of coding and lots of work has to be done. So that is the Chander Control Center, the main spaces. There are some other interesting things to see. You can go ahead and run down this virtual tour anytime. Um, down here, for example, there's the big IT room, and then there's also a room for sleeping. Uh, in case of inclement weather or any other issue that might arise, Chandra can never be abandoned. So if there's perhaps like a hurricane that's coming or a really big blizzard, um, 
controllers and other engineers are able to sleep over in the OCC to make sure that someone will be there to take care of Chandra. Because that is how we take Chandra to the doctor, right? Chandra goes a third of the way to the moon. So we have to have people here on earth that are taking Chandra to the doctor by just uploading code. We use code to be able to run Chandra, to be able to fix things on Chandra, to be able to get all of that sciencey goodness down from Chandra and to figure out what's happening in the X-ray universe. So I am going to hop back over to my PowerPoint. Hopefully you're seeing I'm back in PowerPoint at this point. And we're going to launch a second tour for the Chandra spacecraft itself. Just a few quick stops to talk about the different um, kinds of things that you can find on Chandra. And this is narrated by our colleague, April Jubet. So I will rest my voice for a second and let her take over the tour. Welcome to NASA's Chandra X-ray Observatory. Click anywhere on the screen to orbit the spacecraft and see it from all angles. Clicking will move you along to another stop on the tour. Chandra is almost 14 meters long, about the size of a school bus. It is only centimeters smaller than the largest payload the space shuttle could carry. X-rays are too energetic to bounce off traditional mirrors like we use to see our reflection. Instead, Chandra has nested, barrel-shaped mirrors that allow the X-rays to skip like a pebble across a pond and then focus on the detector 10 meters away. Chandra uses cameras and spectrometers at its target to analyze the X-rays coming from deep space. Chandra's solar panels collect power for the telescope's detectors and its radio communication with the Earth. The electricity is also used to heat the mirrors to keep them from deforming in the cold temperatures of space. In order to provide motion to the observatory, Chandra has two different sets of thrusters. Chandra aims with high-precision gyroscopes. The antennas on Chandra are its link to NASA's Deep Space Network, a series of three radio dishes located at different parts of Earth. Once on Earth, the system delivers the data to the Chandra X-ray Center in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And there we are. I think I will stop there. And Chandra is almost 14 meters long, about the size of a school bus. Oop. It is okay. All right, back to PowerPoint. And as I mentioned, the other virtual tour, the same one here, you can go ahead and tour it yourself if you have um, just a simple smartphone and uh, Google Cardboard even to be able to immerse yourself in Chandra's hardware. So we have all of that data that I talked about, that information that had been packaged up into a suitcase of binary code, a digital suitcase. Binary code essentially is just a system of talking to machines. Telescopes like Chandra that are out in space use binary code, but many objects here on Earth do as well. We're using binary code to be able to talk to our smartphones, to our laptops, even sometimes these days to smart refrigerators and smart toasters. Binary code is just essentially a system of ones and zeros, which are like ons and offs. And ons and offs are kind of useful because these are electrical devices and typically they have responses with an on or an off. So 
Once we have that binary code unpacked, we translate it and take it into a table, essentially unpacking it and using other software encoding to be able to extrapolate all of the information to get the time, the location, and the energy of each photon, each packet of information or packet of light that we were able to get during the observation. And then we can unpack it further and translate it into another form, such as an image like I have on the screen now. That raw image, that raw data has to be processed further because we can't naturally see or natively see x-rays with human vision. So we have to be able to translate it from something we can't see into something we can see. And we apply color as one of the steps in that process to be able to understand what's happening in our data. So this is the very first image that we ever released from Chandra. It's a beautiful supernova remnant called Cassiopeia A, a very dear friend of mine. It's located 10,000 light years away in the Milky Way galaxy, so not that far, uh, 10,000 times 10 trillion kilometers, and it's really not that far, cosmically speaking. Within that first observation from Chandra, just one hour of observing time, we found a beautiful deep detail and also the leftover core of that star that had exploded, what's called a neutron star that can be left behind. And that's the very bright white yellow dot right at the central region. But today, after being a mature mission of over 20 years, we now have lots of data on Cassiopeia A and other supernova remnants as well. And now we're looking at over a million seconds worth of data. And what we've done is we've been able to break apart the light into essentially the various chemical emissions, the chemical elements that we can detect in them. And we've color coded them like we would color code temperature, say on a weather map um, or wind speed on a weather map. Instead of coloring temperature or wind speed, we're coloring those chemical elements. So the silicon, the sulfur, the oxygen, the argon, those have all been color coded in different colors. And for example, in this image now, the iron is color coded in purple. So we have a beautiful way to be able to understand how those different kinds of light, those different emissions from chemical elements are um, shown in this really stunning nebula. That we can also do more of it is exciting too. We can take it and bring it into a 3D model because we have really good data of this object. And I'm gonna take you on a short virtual tour of Cassiopeia A in three dimensions as well, um, using augmented reality. As I mentioned, we are able to break down all of that light that we've detected, that X-ray light by which kinds of chemical elements that we've got going here. And you'll see in in the interactive version that we can actually change those colors and turn them on and off. So right now iron in this version is in green and you can really pump up the green to see where the iron is. What's interesting about this is that a star like Cassiopeia A, which is many times the size of our sun, when it's getting ready to explode, it builds up iron right at its very central core just before it explodes. And then after that core collapses and it explodes, it's guts out all over to the universe. Now you can see that the iron that was once in the central region is all around the sort of outer areas or the perimeter. So a star like Cassiopeia A can kind of turn itself inside out. And we can also turn on the outer debris field. We can turn up the argon so you can really see where that is. We can turn down the debris. We can turn up the neon to see where those pockets are. So anyways, this is able, um, you're all able to be able to interact with this model as well. So feel free to follow that URL. And we will have all of the URLs that we're mentioning today um, in the chat as well, if they're not there already. So we have this beautiful 3D model of an exploded star that Cassiopeia A, our good friend, that's blown its guts out all over the place. We can take that 3D model and 3D print it so that we can hold a very tiny version of it in our hands. It's great because particularly for people who are either blind or low vision, they have new access to this information when we're able to work with a 3D print. And we can do lots of different things with it as well. We can bring it into virtual reality. This is one of my students who's going to be exploring around the inside of that exploded star. And again, she can see where that iron, the silicon, the sulfur, etc., all tend to be laid out. And we can even take that information and map that image into sound. So this is what it sounds like when we translate it from an image into something we can hear.
so data sonification is essentially just another way to be able to learn about our data or to be able to communicate our data with somebody else. And it's, I think, a very beautiful way to be able to do that. So I'd like to take a quick break to hear from Dr. Belinda Wilkes again, our former director, on how cool it is that we can use Chandra and other telescopes to do these things. We are on this tiny little planet next to a very ordinary star that's in the middle of its life in a fairly normal spiral galaxy in some corner of the universe. And the universe is huge and there are billions and billions of stars and billions and billions of galaxies and supermassive black holes. And yet we are sitting on this earth and we're able to understand at least some of what we're seeing by just looking. And I think that's just such an interesting thing to think about, right? That all of this information that we're gathering, we're, we're here on earth and our telescopes are really not that far. Chandra goes a third of the way to the moon, which is really in the grand scheme of things, not far at all. But we'll be able to collect all of this, this information of the high energy universe around us just by looking out there and then using code to be able to extrapolate all that information and figure things out. So what are the, the different kinds of computer languages that we use on board Chandra and to talk to Chandra and to be able to analyze all that data that I've been talking about? Quite a hodgepodge. We've got Fortran, Perl, C, C++. We've got Ada. We've got Python, MATLAB, Java, Perl, so many different kinds of languages. These days, we also use things like C Sharp, Unity Scripting, G Code, and GML to be able to create those 3D models or virtual reality, we use JavaScript and a host of other scripting languages as well. So pretty much coding runs our understanding of the universe because we can't access Chandra any other way. We can't get up there and visit it. So now we're gonna take our third poll and our final poll. Essentially, we'd just like to know what kinds of languages you all have been able to learn or if you've ever tried coding at all. So go ahead and answer the question in the poll. Have you ever tried coding? Yes, indeed, or perhaps not yet. I'll just say while we're taking that poll that I learned how to code in college because I needed to learn it for a work study program to help pay my way through college. And the professor that I worked for wanted me to build a web page. So I learned HTML and I built my first very ugly but very useful web page for economics. And it taught me a lot. It was actually really cool to be able to learn. And then from there, I learned JavaScript and then I learned C++ plus object oriented coding and kind of kept going. And these days I don't do a lot of direct coding anymore, but I learned these languages as a way to be able to essentially talk to someone else in that language, right? The language of programming. Um, it's just like being able to learn French or Mandarin or any other languages. It's a fantastic tool to have in your tool belt. So it looks like most people have tried coding before, but there are still plenty that have not yet. And indeed, you have lots of time to be able to um, learn coding. As I said, I didn't learn it until I was in college and had no idea exactly how very useful coding would become for me. So we're going to shut down the poll. And uh, I'm going to hand it over at this point to Kristen, who's going to take you on a tour of some of the things that you can do with our Chandra and other data from other NASA's Universe of Learning resources. So go ahead, Kristen, and take it away. Thanks, Kim. Um, hi, everyone. Just, just so you know, there's a chance you might hear my dog snoring. <laughs> <laughs> been snoring so loudly through this whole presentation. Oh, I love it. <laughs> but um, yeah, so we have a lot of really fun activities uh, that will help you to explore coding and space science. And um, just a quick note to educators, if you participate in an hour of code, you'll see that many of these activities fit really nicely into that. Um, so the first one we are discussing is our how to talk to spacecraft site. Um, and here, uh, it, it did seem like some of you have done some coding, but for those of you who haven't, um, you can learn to write your name in binary code. You can create beaded pins and bracelets with secret binary messages. And then there's also a newer activity called binary beats where you can create music based on binary code. I think we have a little video of that. <laughs> I 
I always love that music. <laughs> I, do, I do a little dance. I'm not gonna <laughs> Me too. <laughs> um, so the next one we have is called Recoloring the Universe. And this is a computer-based activity. There are follow-along videos. Um, so and you'll learn basic coding skills usually using actual Chandra data on exploded stars and star forming regions and black holes. Here we have some of the, mm -hmm. some of the things you can do. Um, and next we have uh, uh, 3D printing with Tinkercad. I'm sure a lot of you have used Tinkercad. Um, we have our own special activity series that takes you through the basics of 3D modeling and astronomy. You can create simple basic shapes and then work your way to an earth moon system and all the way up to using actual data uh, to create exploded stars. And these also have um, videos as well as written instructions. Oh, the video doesn't wanna play, but we'll move on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, and then if you have access to a 3D printer, you can um, download files uh, and print models of supernova, pulsars, uh, even a Chandra spacecraft. So each section um, has images and videos about each object. And then towards the end, you'll see examples of the model and the files that you'll, you would need. And here's a little passe. Yeah, and I probably I don't think I said the size, but size of actuality of Cas A, it's about 40 million billion times the surface area of our sun. Um, so April here is holding a tiny four inch version. So it is much, much scaled down from the actual thing. And um, JS9, I think we, we kind of briefly talked about, but it's an online data image analysis program. Uh, used by professional astronomers, and we have a student-friendly uh, version. And uh, again, there are tutorials that explore um, the deep sky object in depth. And lastly, we have um, our Reach Across the Stars, which is our new free augmented reality app. You can download it anywhere you normally download apps. Um, here you can explore the universe and unlock um, often overlooked stories of women in space science. So there are short stories within the app and then longer journeys. And in these journeys, you can ask questions, you can listen to interviews, you can explore 360 degree virtual reality content. Um, for instance, you can get a behind the scenes look at the Mars 2020 rover with Christina Hernandez, who is currently an instrument engineer at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Being an engineer to me was a game changer. It gives me a platform to speak about things that I'm passionate about, such as science, but it also taught me how to be self-sufficient, how to think about complex problems and find simple solutions and how to use my ability as a collaborator, as a leader, as a team player, to help us answer some of scientists' most difficult questions. Yeah, so that's a lot of info. Um, I did put links into the chat a little earlier, but I will also put it, put it in again um, towards the end after our Q&A. Awesome. Thank you, Kristen. And I just want to end this sort of formal aspect of the webinar with a, a little video from a colleague, Dr. Daniel Castro. Um, he's just a really cool person and has this nice stuff to say on exactly how much we've learned from Chandra since being launched. We didn't know that stars could emit x-rays, for example, on the way they do it. We didn't understand how stars blew up. We didn't understand black holes in nowhere close to as much detail as we do now. We don't understand the clusters of galaxies that make up the, you know, the web of space-time in the detail that we understand it now. Chandra represents a huge step forward in astronomy in general. 
I really like what he has to say there. We didn't. And I just hope that you have all enjoyed this time travel with us. Uh, since all of these objects are very far away from us, it takes the light a very long time to reach us, which means we're looking essentially at baby pictures in a yearbook of the universe. And you have been able to time travel from the very comfort of your own desks at school or perhaps at home, wherever you might be today, looking back thousands, if not millions or billions of years um, into what was and perhaps some examples of what might be. So thank you so much for taking this field trip with us. I hope you enjoyed all of the videos and the resources. I know Kristen mentioned that she already popped in the various links Thanks to the items that you can try for yourself. We would love to hear from you if you found any of these resources useful. We're really trying to bring the data that we get to work with every day to other people to be able to do that as well. And pretty much everything we've talked about today has been thanks to coding um, because we could not do any of this without it. And so please feel free to drop some questions in the chat as we move to our Q&A section. I know Kristen's been pretty busy answering questions in the chat as we go. Um, but if there's any questions that haven't been answered yet, Kristen, let me know. Um, else we can uh, wrap up for today. So please do let us know what you thought of this field trip. We will be sending an email out within the next 24 hours with a link to the recording and also um, with a link to a feedback form. Would very, very much appreciate to get some feedback on that feedback form. It really helps us keep doing programs like this when we get um, data that shows it's either working or it's not. Um, so your feedback is very, very much appreciated. And I see um, there is a question in the chat. Are students able to visit the command center in Burlington or someplace similar? That is a great question. Um, there are small uh, numbers of field trips that are allowed in person during non-pandemic times, but during the pandemic, all of that had to stop. Um, even people who work for Chandra are not actually all allowed into a control center right now. We are still under restricted access, and it is also very much restricted during the normal time of the year as well, but we, we can support some small number of physical field trips for local schools and local groups. I just do not know when that will result Zoom uh, due to the pandemic at this time. We've been keeping things very, very safe for our operators and our engineers. But there are other places I'm sure that have tours um, that you could check into if you're in Massachusetts, like the Haystack Observatory, they might be offering tours. I'm sure there are some other smaller observatories that can do tours during the pandemic as well. I know in Rhode Island, for example, there are like three or four different small observatories that are still doing limited groups at this time because it's mostly an outdoor um, type of event. So hopefully that helps. And there are a number of other NASA virtual field trips that you can take in this time as well. If you Google that, um, you will hope, hopefully be able to find some of those as well. Um, and there's another question, where is the code in your universe link? I will go ahead and type that in the chat. It's chandra.si.edu slash code. And that is one of my favorite activities for Hour of Code because you can actually use very basic coding, no previous experience required to be able to work with the NASA data that I get to work with every day. And it's really meant to be an authentic learning experience. So if you do uh, take advantage of that resource, please let us know what you think of it. Are there any other questions from all of our fantastic schools today? We'd be happy to answer them or we can wrap up for the day as well. All right, I am going to stop the recording and um,